growing number of model railroaders are moving towards using servos to operate switches and semaphore signals. Servos sell for only around $2 per drive and provide excellent control characteristics. If you use a servo controller like the one I built starting in video number 17, you can typically adjust upper and lower boundaries of the movement as well as the speed in both directions individually. But of course for true modelers, or shall I say rivet counters, that's not good enough. Real semaphore signals do rarely have a smooth movement from stop to clear and back. There is overshooting or bounce back at the boundaries and sometimes even some hesitation in the middle of the movement. So it is no surprise that I got a request to add these features to my servo decoder. In this video I am going to show you the results and explain how I changed the Arduino sketch to make these nonlinear moves happen. Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. This is what IOTT channel viewer Sam Brown wrote in an email about a month ago. To better understand what he really wants, let's have a little chat with him. My first question would be, what is the idea behind and what are actually really the requirements in terms of what kind of move you, moves you would like to see? Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. So um, I was approached by a, a client of mine who had bought one of these boards um, and it initially um, using your, your sketch that you've developed already was just basic uh, throw and close movements, which for, for budget builds was was key um, and ideal for, for just throwing points. And then this, this client of mine who's uh, part of a fairly large club in, in Wales um, was like, Sam, this is great. However, my club wants it hooked up to semaphore server, uh, semaphore signals. I was like, okay, what, what's what's the problem? He was like, they don't bounce. I was like, <laughs> bounce? And I was exactly the same as you. I was like, do they not just go up and up and down? <laughs> right. Um, so then he, he sent me a video, uh, which I later linked to, to you as well. And uh, I was like, oh, they do. And he was operating on, on O-Gage, where obviously it's quite noticeable not on that scale as to the bounce and the mechanical movement. Um, so absolutely. So I, I went through your your videos, see if you had anything in place or or approached it, um, and then went onto your website and so on. And I thought, well, we've got a bit of a niche niche here potentially. Um, so sent you an email, and I think you kindly replied the, the next day, much to my my surprise, um, say, yeah, give us some information. So uh, I think we then collaborated over the next uh, kind of week or two, didn't we, with with various yeah. videos. Um, with kind of what what aspects we want and so on and uh yeah, what, what you've now developed out of it is is i think a purist would would be inclined to say near near perfection if i'm honest uh, hans uh, very very good work um so as to, to go into kind of movement in a bit more detail uh, a semaphore doesn't just go up up and down as as i initially thought and i'm sure if you initially thought um it, instead we've got going going up we've then got a bit of a hesitation due to uh, mechanical uh, difference or even just yes. a signal and pulling, pulling that action um then hits a hard point and, and stops the the real key is that down motion where it hits the the mechanical stop uh, and almost gravity defying force and we have that, that bounce action that happens three four five times sometimes and of course it's, it's actually quite random depending on signal and and any interference or resistance um, in that process. Um, so what, what what we now have instead of just an open and, and close is a, a prototypical semaphore signal um, that as I said looks looks phenomenal, really does. I understand you you are going you, you have your own hardware, right? Can you maybe explain that a little bit what you're doing there and show us the board? Oh, absolutely. So I've got uh, a board um, plug in, in loosely see if we can see that just there um, I'm just going to switch over to them um, so this this is the board that uh, I used from an open source design um, found on, on the internet um, however incorporated it to try and be as as user friendly as possible um, this board is in short we've got uh, DCC input uh, here and then your, your 5 volt input here the powers your Arduino Nano and then also we have the option of adding the uh, PC9865 uh, servo shield or a uh, four-way relay shield here. 
So let's now have a look into how these nonlinear movements are implemented in the Arduino sketch. Before I get started, let me welcome all the new subscribers to the IOTT channel. Thank you for all the likes and comments, either here or in the various social media groups. As it looks, the IOTT channel is just about to reach 1000 subscribers. So if you like what you see, please go ahead, subscribe and click the bell icon, so you will have a premium seat when more videos become available. The first thing I did is time position diagrams for all the movements I wanted to be able to do. Up to now, the only thing the decoder was capable of was a linear movement with only the speed adjustable, which just results in a different slope. The new requirements now call for nonlinear movements, which means the slope is changing along the path because there is acceleration or deceleration. This could be as simple as a soft start and soft stop, where there is just an acceleration and deceleration phase at the beginning and end of the movement. Then there could be a hesitation, meaning a temporary slowdown or even standstill somewhere in the middle of the path. And finally, some crazy movements at the end of the path, either oscillation from overshooting or bounce back, caused by running into a mechanical stop. From looking at this, it becomes clear that there are two completely different categories of movements. The first category is everything that happens along the slope, essentially just acceleration, continuous move and deceleration. And the second category is a dampened sinusoidal oscillation along the final target position. Both categories require completely different types of movements, so it makes sense to distinguish this status in the algorithm, as we will see. So let's have a closer look at the linear move. Servos are controlled by just setting the position as a value between minimum and maximum. As soon as a new position is set, the servo rushes to that new position as fast as possible. The typical speed is about 1200 positions or increments per second. And it is depending on the supply voltage, the force the servo is moving against, and the PWM frequency of the decoder. For our application, however, we want to control the speed of the servo and be able to accelerate and decelerate, so we have to provide for that in software. The way to do that is adding a variable for the current position and a velocity vector variable that keeps track of the current speed. With that, we can write a status machine function that is called, say, every 5 milliseconds. It calculates and sets the new position of the servo using the formula you know from your physics classes. The moving direction is determined by the sign of the velocity. That is simple. But to put it in an algorithm, there is more to take care of. Let's assume we want to be able to move at speeds from about 10 to 1200 increments per second, which is the maximum speed of the servo. If the status machine is called every 5 milliseconds, that would mean that the minimum speed of 10 increments per second, the current position would change by 0.05 increments each time. Unfortunately, the servo cannot do fractions of an increment, so the movement would be lost. To avoid that, I have to keep track of fractions in the software. The problem with that is that memory on the Arduino is very precious, and the floating point variable takes 4 bytes. To avoid that, I settled with a 2-byte unsigned integer and multiply positions by 64. This gives me 10-bit for the integer value, and 6 bits for the fractional part. More importantly, for a servo decoder with 16 channels, it saves me 32 bytes, which is significant. On the other end of the range, we face a similar problem. If speed is higher than 200 increments per second, we should move more than one increment every cycle, or alternatively shorten the cycle time. After some consideration, I decided to make both the cycle time and the number of increments 
variable in each step. So every time the status machine is called, it looks at the current speed and then determines the ideal number of increments to move and the time to wait before calling the function again, of course with a minimum of 5 milliseconds between two calls. And just to give the user some options, I made this refresh interval configurable and specified in microseconds, so it can be changed from 5000 microseconds to maybe 10 or 15000 microseconds. Why would you want to do that? Consider this. The execution time of the status machine function for one servo is about 2500 microseconds. So if you run more than three servos simultaneously, there will be a slowdown caused by the processor load. If you change the refresh interval to 10,000 microseconds, you create room for running more servos simultaneously, but with lower resolution on each movement. Ok, you may not be able to see a difference between 5 and 10 milliseconds refresh time, but if you go to 20 or even 50 milliseconds, there will be more vibration in the movement and the sound from the servo will be different. But you can test that for yourself, the software just gives you the options. With those problems resolved, the linear part becomes easy. Every time the status machine function is called, it determines the current status in terms of the movement. Is the current move in the right direction? Is it going up or down? Is it already at full speed or still accelerating? Is the current position before or after the hesitation point if applicable? What is the required speed at the end of the movement? And if that is below the normal linear speed, where is the point to start slowing down? Once these elements are clear, it is then a simple decision to either accelerate, decelerate or just keep moving. That's basically all for the linear movement. Once the target position for the linear move is reached, it either is done or goes into oscillation mode. Oscillation mode is a sine wave with an exponential dampening as the time goes on. When overshooting, it is the full wave oscillating around the final target value. In the case of a bounce back, all peaks are oriented the same way, up in the lower position and down in the upper position. For the latter, I am not sure whether it exists in reality, but anyway. So, here are the formulas for overshooting and for bounce back. So in both cases we are looking at the function of time from the start of the wave. Therefore all calculations are based on the system time when the transition from linear mode to oscillating mode happens. So the status machine just repeats the calculation every refresh interval, determining the time since the start of the oscillation calculating the amplitude and sending the value to the servo. This is repeated until the peak value of the oscillation is down to 10% of the start value and the start value is calculated based on the servo speed when entering the oscillation and the oscillation frequency. So if you ever wondered back in high school why you are learning all that geometry stuff, here you have a practical application. Finally, I added some configuration possibilities so that every servo can have its own behavior. Here is a comparison of the configuration data of the original decoder from video number 17 with the new dataset used to configure the dynamic movements. The first thing I changed is the way how the servo speed is defined. In the old version it was the time between two incremental steps of the servo. That was ok at the time, but for more sophisticated movements I needed real speed, so I changed that into increments per second. Remember, the servo going full speed is somewhere around 1200 to 1500 increments per second, so the 320 as shown in this configuration is probably about 25%. At the end you see three more variables with a value of zero. Those are used internally by the status machine. 
It does not really matter, but it is best to just keep them at zero in the configuration data. Then I added five more variables to configure how the server moves. The first one is the actual configuration byte. The lower nibble is when the server goes to higher increments or to the closed position. The higher nibble is for the other direction. In each nibble, the first two bits define how the movement stops. The third bit defines the start mode and bit number four indicates the presence of a hesitation on the way to the target position. The next two bytes provide the configuration data for the oscillation if it is used. The first is the lambda factor that defines the dampening of the oscillation. Higher values mean more dampening and the data is encoded to save memory space. Each nibble takes a value from 0 to 15 or hex F, resulting in a lambda factor from 0.5 to 8 with increments of 0.5. The second is the oscillation frequency. Higher values mean a quicker oscillation. And as with lambda, the frequency is calculated from a value of 0 to hex F or 15, resulting in an oscillation frequency of 0.5 to 8 Hz. I find that a frequency value of 5, which results in a 3 Hz oscillation, is probably the most realistic setting. But do as you wish. The final two values define the location and the final speed of the hesitation if configured. The location is the exact position of where the speed is at minimum. Before and after that position there is deceleration and reacceleration. The speed at this very position is defined in the second byte. A value of zero means the movement comes to a complete but very brief stop. So, let me show you some videos demonstrating some of the typical configurations. Note that I am using a simple rack and pinion assembly to convert the servo rotation into a linear movement. I downloaded it from Thingiverse and 3D printed it. The link for the 3D files are in the description below. The important thing is that you use a mechanism that converts the entire rotation into a linear movement with the same ratio along the entire move. If you use a wire hook on your servo, there are positions where the rotational motion will not result in a movement of the push rod, so you will not see any effect of the oscillation on your semaphore signal.
Okay, I hope this gives you a good idea what nonlinear movements this new algorithm for the servo decoder can do. As always, I have uploaded the sketch to my GitHub page listed below, so you can play for yourself. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you. If so, click the like button below to let me know. Doing so helps to promote this video and the IOTT channel in general, because YouTube likes the likes. Thanks for watching and see you next time.